Harrison, who's talking to us from Cambridge University Press, um, and he's looking at alternative formats of scholarly communication. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much um, for the invitation here this morning. So, um, I work um, in the Humanities and Social Sciences group at, uh, at Cambridge University Press. I'm going to talk this morning about an initiative that I've been working on quite a lot over the last two or three years with uh, my colleague in our science group, who's away in India this week. But we've been working for some time about looking at a, um, an alternative um, format, a hybrid between books and journals, because we think, as we'll talk about later, that the distinction between books and journals is somewhat artificial. So we've been looking at ways in which we could, in a digital environment, kind of uh, think of new ways of uh, scholarly communication. It's, uh, we'll be launching next year, but it's still in sort of early development phase. And so one of the things which I'd be interested from this meeting is to get your feedback about some of the ideas that we've had. So just uh, very briefly, Cambridge University Press, I'm not sure how aware you are of us all, but um, we're very much a part of the university. Um, we are board of governors and made up of senior academics and senior administrators in the university. We share the same values and uh, mission of the university to kind of to advance uh, research and learning. Um, I'm pleased to say also that we, uh, um, even though we're classified as a kind of not-for-profit organisation, we are actually contribute to uh, university um, revenues. The university expects us to be self-financing to you know, make money to invest in our future publishing and any profit or any surplus, as we used to call it, um, that we make, we uh, hand over to the university. So no, we're very proud to be part of this, you know, this great kind of research, world-class world research university. Um, like the university, we're quite an old institution, not quite as old as the university, but we've been around since 1534. And over the years, we've grown to be, along with our friends at Oxford, uh, by far and away the biggest university press in the world. And each year, we publish just under 400 uh, scholarly journals and about 1,500 books, new books each year, which we, um, and we aim to publish everything simultaneously in print and digital. Open access, which is the theme of this week, has been uh, a major preoccupation for us at the press, particularly my colleagues in sort of the science journals. We've got 23 fully a OA journals. We've published almost 4,500 um, OA articles. And we have about just under 200 journals which um, um, have got OA content. Um, and last year, and we have published, we have just launched uh, a new um, publishing platform which combines our books and journals um, content. And that's very relevant to, to this talk. In the past, we had um, books and journals um, siloed in sort of in, in separate platforms. So that's just brief background to us. And as I, say, I come from the humanities and social sciences area, I'm a historian by trade, so I hope you'll forgive a little bit of history to start off with. Um, so since the, um, the very first scientific journal was published, the um, Transactions of the Royal Society in the 1660s, I think kind of scholarly communication has really been effectively been dominated either by um, journal article or book. So um, um, Newton's Principia Mathematica, the same sort of time as um, the the transactions. So that that kind of got go that process got going in the 17th century, and it's pretty much continued um, and accelerated all the way through right up into the 21st century. So these days, scientific um, scholarly communication is sort of a, um, it's kind of big business. It's a big uh, major activity. Um, there are approximately 20,000 scientific journals in the world, uh, each year publishing approximately 2 million articles, each year approximately 200,000 new books each year. And this last bullet point there is not intended to be scientific, it was just a kind of a guesstimate uh, last night when I was writing this, that maybe that means that if you look kind of the vast majority of scholarly writing is either actually under 10,000 words, kind of the um, uh, length, typical length of journal articles or over 100,000 words, which is typical sort of length for, for a book. And that just seems kind of weird, really, that you know, it's either got to be short or it's going to be pretty long. So we've been looking um, at whether there's kind of room somewhere in the middle. And I should say we're not the only ones um, who've been doing that. I think uh, people are, particularly in this digital environment, looking at sort of uh, the scope for other, other formats um, um, 
and uh, there have been various initiatives by other publishers, but we think uh, what we're going to describe, what I'm going to describe later is, is fairly um, unique. So there is lots of experimentation. I think some of the, the speakers you uh, have today and certainly had uh, on Wednesday's event um, give some indication of the kind of the amount of activity and experimentation and innovation that's going on in the scholarly communication um, arena. And I think we're largely driven because of sort of the, the, the possibilities that technology now gives us, particularly sort of, you know, the digital publishing uh, means that we have to, we can look at content in a very different way. And some of the constraints that we had were kind of artificial constraints developed really because of actually the, the format of a, a scholarly journal, the requirements for the sort of the, the publishing and uh, manufacturing of that, likewise with, with books and the way that they're kind of uh, uh, manufactured, sold, catalogued, distributed and things. So in a digital environment, we do have the chance to, to look at things in a, a slightly different way. So, um, as I said, we've been looking um, for some time at the press um, about uh, um, whether that distinct, what, what we could bring that's kind of new and um, whether we could think of ways where we could combine some of the best features of um, journals and books. And so we've been talking over the years, we, as commissioning editors, we go to lots of conferences, we knock on a lot of professors' doors, have lots of conversations with, with people all stages of their career. And one of the things which we've heard a lot over the years when um, you know, we've been talking to people, is their frustration, as, you know, from the point of view as a, a, a scholar kind of writing, that they, they'd like to write a little bit more in greater depth than in, uh, in a journal article, but they don't want to give up two or three years of their life to, to write a book. So we've been hearing that, and we've been, so we've been having a conversation um, amongst ourselves and in the press, but also going out to librarians, going out to, to professors to get their sense of um, what we think is sort of good about journal articles and what about books. So just a few things which, and uh, we think reasons why kind of journals are still around and uh, why people like them. Above all, kind of trust. I think the kind of the, the quality assurance of the, the peer review process is uh, something of a kind of a gold standard. People really kind of believe in it. Um, and um, I think uh, that's probably one of the most important features. Um, the kind of the length is quite a good length if you wanting just to kind of to test a discrete argument um, um, and sort of get it out there, get reactions from the community, and then in sort of in subsequent articles you can maybe kind of develop that more. It's relatively speedy publication process once it's got through the peer review acceptance thing, which I realise uh, not always so fast. And I think also because um, it is actually such a big industry, and um, in the talk which was uh, on Wednesday, we're talking about some of the, the, the financial numbers in there. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and I think because of that and because of the scale, it's attracted a lot of innovation um, in and around it, providing all sorts of interesting services to, to, to authors, to, to researchers, to librarians. Um, and so I think we sort of see that there's much more innovations going on, I think, in the, um, in the journals world than in the books world. As a result of that, I think, the sort of, you know, developing better tools all the time for visibility and discoverability, you know, to kind of think of all the, you know, abstracting and indexing services. And, you know, a question for you guys as well, you know, kind of what other things, what, what do you like about journal articles? And I'd be interested to, to hear your views on that. On the flip side, um, are there any disadvantages? Well, I think kind of uh, the message that we've heard over the years quite a bit about the, the length as a constraint if people want to tell a bigger story, um, it's kind of uh, frustrating. Journal articles, um, typically, not necessarily the best place for advancing interdisciplinary research. It's quite difficult, I think. Most, most journals are kind of embedded in the inner discipline. So kind of uh, how, to, um, how to kind of encourage and foster interdisciplinary research. And then a, a question which I put something, um, a quote I was really struck by um, from the late Ken Arrow, Nobel laureate in, in uh, economics, was kind of looking at the way in which the sort of the acceptance procedures and the kind of the outcomes of peer review processes in, in leading economics journals and suggesting that actually the really interesting innovative ideas were kind of often sort of failing to get accepted by, by um, by journal editors because of the pressures that they have are very much to sort of to reinforce the existing paradigm. So if, you, if you're trying to kind of break into that, it's maybe not so um, 
not so easy in the journal world. But I put that as very much as a question mark. I mean, I think um, agree, disagree with that. And there are probably some other disadvantages as well. Reasons to love books. Well, I think above all, the kind of the, the length, you know, kind of you have kind of scope within um, your word length, which kind of I say 100,000 words, but it could be 200,000 words or 300,000 words. You have a lot of space there to, you know, to, develop, um, to develop arguments, you know, to um, make all sorts of connections between related literature and things, all sorts of things which you can't do, obviously, in a, um, um, within the context of a journal. And a lot of the, the, you know, kind of the really classic books, um, particularly sort of the, kind of the graduate level um, textbooks and so forth, they represent the kind of the, the results of you know, often kind of decades of research and teaching. I mean, it's a really um, sort of a capstone to a lot of um, you know, kind of scholars' careers that you know they've they've invested a, a life in researching and teaching in an area, and then they sort of um, bringing bringing that together in a book format to benefit the community. Um, in the in the context of the, um, the kind of both the, the way in which books are kind of viewed and judged and the space that they provide, it's often a lot easier to accommodate interdisciplinary perspectives. Um, there's certainly a lot more scope to reflect much more on the contributions of the existing literature. You can do much, um, uh, so kind of easier to situate your work um, and give readers uh, some insights into what's important in the existing literature. And then if you're thinking of particularly on the more sort of pedagogical aspects of it, you have more scope within a book, um, uh, book format to, um, you know, to, to, to think of ways in which you can help um, kind of readers and students kind of learn from, from what you're doing. And I'm sure there are other benefits as well. People actually also like the feel of books, I think, as well. So disadvantages, um, it's a big investment of time. You know, as I said, these, uh, it's, Obviously, going to take longer to write a hundred thousand word um, book than it is a you know, kind of five thousand word journal article. It takes longer for us to produce. Typically, it'll take us about nine months to get um, from manuscript to books on on shelves. I think there's been some concern, which I personally think, from a perspective of a books editor at a leading university press, is is overstated. But undou undoubtedly, within the context of sort of tenure committees and research assessment um, exercises. There's some concern about sort of is the quality assurance sort of as consistent across publishers as it is maybe um, um, across kind of journals, um, and it's only very recently I think that we've started to see a really kind of serious effort to kind of um, to index books with the same kind of rigor and um, uh, as has happened in in, um, in journals. So Web of Science book book index is pretty good. It's 60,000 books now are indexed and they're adding a lot every year, but it's some way behind the kind of the, the journals. And I think partly because it's kind of it's less big business, that sort of it's more of a traditional format. Over the years, we've seen much less investment in innovation in the book world. Now, that's changing kind of fast, and certainly a lot of the stuff we're doing at, um, at the press, um, we're kind of looking hard at, at ways in which you know, we, we can innovate and we're kind of spending a lot of thought about um, you know, kind of what a kind of a, a digital first uh, book might look like. But on the whole, in, in the round, there's been much less investment in innovation in the books world. So we've been asking ourselves, um, you know, sort of within the press and going out into the community and with librarians, is it possible to combine the best of both worlds? And our answer to this is a new format which we'll be launching um, next year called Cambridge Elements. Um, we published the, the first um, few of these uh, just in the last couple of months. So very briefly, um, uh, these are going to be kind of short format, 20 to 30,000 word pieces of content, organised within um, very, very focused series edited by, by leading scholars. So borrowing a lot from the architecture of the journals world, having kind of a focused series in the same way that you have focused journals. Um, so, yeah, so organised and focused series edited by leading scholars. So, and we hope that over time we expect within any series to publish four or five of these elements a year. So that over four or five years we'll build up a really um, uh, comprehensive um, library providing a dynamic coverage of the, the state of the field in research. As I said, content typically 20 to 30,000 words. And we're asking authors to, to um, look at ways in which they can combine personal insights from their own research with um, situating that 
with him a very kind of their personal take on what's really important in the literature and where their field is going. So um, forward-looking kind of reviews rather than exhaustive backward-looking ones. Um, so what we're hoping to do is from journals, we're kind of uh, borrowing, we're um, um, following the kind of similar kind of uh, quality assurance procedures, the same kind of uh, peer review sort of processes. Um, everything absolutely, you know, kind of uh, very thoroughly reviewed, organised, to say, in, in series, edited by leading scholars with editorial boards and so forth. We're offering speedy publication, so from acceptance of um, the manuscript through to, to publication, 12 weeks. And we're promising that this is going to be a sort of, uh, from an innovation point of view, it's going to be very dynamic. It's going to start from the start to benefit from the functionality that we have in the Cambridge Core platform, the, the platform we launched last year, combining books and journal content. Um, so that has all sorts of functionality in terms of kind of um, search and um, um, metrics and so forth. Um, and that all the time, we're adding to that functionality um, sort of, you know, kind of every, every month. So those are some of the things we're hoping to take from books, but uh, from journals and from books, we're offering you know, somewhat more space to, to develop an argument so that you know, if, you've, if you've written two or three articles um, and you like to try and sort of find a way of actually kind of bringing them, pulling them together to, sort of to tell that bigger story, to, you know, to, to join the dots, you have more scope for doing that. But you don't have to commit to writing you know, kind of a, a huge um, 100,000 word monograph on the subject. I say we're giving um, authors the opportunity to talk a bit about their own research but also to, to um, to reflect on what their colleagues and what the rest of the literature is doing. And we're also got quite a, um, had a, a lot of very positive feedback from when reviewing all these about how useful these are going to be in the context of sort of graduate teaching. So we're looking at ways in which we can improve their pedagogical aspect with you know, providing kind of data sets and various other tools for people to use. Um, as I say, we're doing this. Um, yeah, so additionally, um, we want to try and make these as author-friendly as possible, so authors retaining copyright. Um, because it's going to be a digital first publication, um, it's possible to allow to use and embed audio and video files in it. And we also think um, uh, very keen to encourage authors, it's not, it's not a, an absolute contractual requirement, but we're encouraging authors to update their content on an, on an annual basis so that they can keep kind of references current, that they can, if there's new kind of data, that we can keep that current. Um, and we're wanting to make sure that these are going to be available in a, as wide a variety as sort of purchase options as possible. So we're, um, you know, kind of, so, so libraries may buy a whole kind of series um, in digital format only, but an individual researcher just seeing one individual element that they might like has got the possibility to buy just that one element in either kind of print or, or digital format. Um, we're looking, as I say, um, future functionality. Some of this is sort of in the pipeline, going to be within the next uh, month or so. Others will be kind of maybe later next year. So we're looking a lot around enhanced data visualization. I think we can do a lot more to with with data to kind of to make that kind of a, a more interactive experience. Um, um, we're looking at ways in which we can sort of um, embed executable code so people can sort of play around with that themselves, putting in altmetrics, um, annotations, so to have sort of, kind of sharing and, um, and so forth, uh, relatedness, so you can sort of see how these content in the, um, the elements relates to um, uh, other journal literature or book literature which we have on the Cambridge site. And again, a question for you, what sort of functionality would you, at your stage, would you find most useful, you know, if you were imagining completely new types of, um, um, of uh, scholarly publication, what would you like to see? What kind of functionality you'd find really helpful? So, interested to know that. Um, as they will be launching next, um, next year, so far we've commissioned over 40 series um, in the arts and sciences from leading scholars from North America, Europe and Asia. Quite a number of uh, series have got local Cambridge University um, editorial boards. So we published our very first content, um, first three or four of these individual elements are now live on our core platform. Um, but we're wanting to build up a critical mass before we have a more formal launch um, next year. The, so the purchase um, options for, for libraries when they get um, 
purchases, they will have unlimited usage and perpetual access, so it's a great deal, and this is why it's going to be very useful for people teaching, you know, kind of classes, they're able to pick and choose um, elements to be able to, to assign a class, there's no kind of copyright problems with that. Individuals, as I mentioned, have options to buy just individual uh, elements, print and digital, and um, for our open access policies, um, I think probably the most important one of that is going to be our green policy where we're very happy for submitted manuscripts to be um, to be posted on personal web pages, uh, repositories and some social sharing sites. Um, we are also imagining that some series will want to have kind of gold open access and the, the, the fee for that will be kind of agreement depending on the, the series. Um, so finally, yeah, this is what um, um, they kind of look like, I'm afraid. Um, so those are five, five individual elements and five different series um, which are up on, on our core website. Um, it's possible to, to, um, to read them in the HTML core reader on core or to um, in PDF. Or if you prefer kind of print, we have kind of print on demand options for all of those as well. So um, I say so far we've got there's uh, a series there in philosophy. Uh, another one in statistics, another one in political economy, another one in uh, political economy, and another one in quantitative and computational methods and social science research, Twitter is data. And, um, so it is really kind of, we've had a good reaction from across, um, across the field, really. It's, uh, it's not intended to be a solely humanities and social sciences or STM uh, type of initiative. It's across the piece. That's a race through. As I said, I'd be really interested in, in your reactions. It's new. We have a chance still to develop and shape this. So um, that's all I have this morning. So that um, uh, web address there, you can go in and take a look yourselves. So thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah. And then you're expecting that people will come to you? How's that going to work? So, yeah, so to begin with, I think um, we've, uh, um, our series editors are identifying, you know, kind of topics and authors which they know are really interesting in the field, and they're going out, and it's um, uh, a lot more by kind of invitation, I think, to begin with, because it's not yet known, and we're wanting to, you know, particularly also to get some really interesting um, projects are some of our, our first ones. So a lot of the process to begin with is by invitation, but it's still going through peer review, if that makes sense. Um, but as the word gets out, and we're starting to get unsolicited um, uh, proposals as well, which go through the same kind of acceptance procedure as, as in journals. So going through to the series editor um, and then um, um, making the same decisions about you know whether they're going to do desk reject or, uh, or take through to peer review. And is there, is there a submission, I mean, there are a lot of people working on uh, yeah. this way, but you talk, talked earlier about the yeah. submission process for yeah. pitching a book. Yeah. Is it similar, the pitch similar to that? Yeah, some, again, I think it's sort of, we'd want to, if you're, if you're thinking of uh, writing this, I think it's important that people understand, you know, what the concept is, because we have had a number of people approaching us saying they've got some content in, um, Subject X, and we don't actually uh, we don't have a series in Subject X, so uh, we would be unable to consider that for um, for for publication because it has we have to have a series into which it would fit. Right. If that makes sense. In the same way as that um, uh, for journals. Yeah. So for for pitching to, um, but the pitch is somewhat more is, um, closer to the journals world. I think the pitch is much more to the academic series editor than to the press. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Does. Yeah. And dare I ask about royalties? So yeah. So we're um, the for royalties we're uh, we're paying probably uh, just a flat honorarium um, for elements rather than royalties for it. So you, yeah. sort of you get a one-off sort of payment. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Raise that. Yeah. 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 So we're kind of we anticipating basically two two levels of update. One would be kind of a relatively kind of minor one, which would be uh, which wouldn't require a review process, which would be to um, um, update literature. Obviously, this would be with the 
agreement of the series editors and so forth, um, which would be updating you know, kind of uh, references and if there's if it's a, uh, like some content which is sort of dependent on some sort of data or if it's in, say, in politics and there's been an election or whatever, then um, uh, you could reflect on that. Um, and those we want, to, we're having an annual kind of window for people to come in and do that, and we will have a, um, a system of version control so that it's clear for people when they're kind of citing um, what version that they're citing, and we will archive the, the original one. Um, and we're also looking at, and though for librarians who, who um, buy the, um, the elements, there'll be no additional charge. That's part of the added value of the, of the acquisition. Um, but if you want wanting to make more substantial revisions, um, equivalent to doing a new edition of a book, um, then that would go through some kind of uh, um, review process again. Okay. So does that mean for individuals who purchased the original version, they won't get the update until they buy it again? Or so I think for individuals, I mean, for the, for the, the, the libraries, I think, would get the, um, the updates. I think individuals buying an individual standalone thing, I think it would be difficult to, yeah. to find ways that they could get the update as well. But yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So I was wondering, when we were talking about the lesson about journalism, lesson about books, yeah. um, there was one thing in there, uh, in the journal that I saw, as you asked them, yeah. Yeah. the very nice, sometimes it seems with journals, as, a, as you said, you make a clean and succinct argument. Yeah. Um, but sometimes, uh, due to the space constraints, people aren't able to expand and yeah. say what else might be a yeah. particular journal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got a very sort of small sample of <laughs> to it's based on. Um, I've read, I've, I've read one of those, um, um, and I know that the so the the um, the one in the middle about um, economic development I read, and that's actually got the 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 review and the way in which the author is putting um, kind of reviewing alternative um, viewpoints in the literature and situating his own work in that is actually quite interesting and does sort of resonate with what you're saying about having more, sp more space to have sort of, it's not just pushing kind of one line, it's actually kind of allowing, you know, kind of multiple possibilities, so, yeah. Great. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Good job, you. Thank you.